we have finally reached the fourth episode, Intro to DIEs. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Jerome. So, um, yeah, today we're talking about a, a variable interest a entity, which is an accounting term or VIE. And, you know, this is a slightly complicated topic, but basically a VIE is a nominee company that Chinese companies have been using in order to go listed overseas. And as you can see on this slide, many of China's most famous, largest, most global companies have used VIE models for them to go overseas. But it is also used by foreign companies, perhaps less publicly, in order to get around restrictions in sensitive sectors in the, you know, foreign, to foreign investment. And so there are questions always about whether it is legally enforceable or not. Uh, and you know, there will be, it is a gray area of the law and there may be challenges in enforcing these contractual obligations. Uh, but I'll perhaps now explain how the VI model works. So, you know, basically the, we have an international company and this company will want to be involved in a sector that's restricted under PRC law. And it may be restricted in part or fully. Some of our clients, 90% of their business is not restricted, but they do need this one operational license and they pick a VIE model for that reason. Others, uh, the whole business is restricted. So they need a VIE to operate the whole of their business. So this international company will then typically set up a wholly foreign owned enterprise or WUFI. It'll be 100% owned by the international company. And this WUFI will carry out the permitted business, will hire the employees, enter into the contracts with the local entity, which is this nominee entity, which is what we would call the VIE. And so there'll be arrangements, contractual arrangements, which I'll discuss in a minute, between the VIE entity and the WUFI. But you know, the basic rule is as much business employees and cash that you can put in the WUFI, the better. And you know, you should really restrict the local entity to the minimum it requires to obtain the licenses and to operate. And then the other piece of the puzzle is the PRC nominee. Uh, most cases, it's a PRC citizen, could be a company, and most clients choose a trusted PRC employee. This can be difficult because it then blurs the relationship between employee and partner. Sometimes the employees, it can lead to them feeling much more involved in the business and not just a pure employee. And if it's an absolute crucial part of your business, you may not want that in the hands of your employees. So, you know, picking the right nominee, you know, can be an issue. The other issue is, like I, I mentioned in the previous um, episode, operational licenses can lead to quite a large investment requirement. So funding the PRC nominee is important because they will have to fund the local entity. So that's another issue to look at. Okay. So this slide you know, is a bit similar, but just to go into some more detail about how the contracts are. So, you know, firstly, we have the headquarters. Uh, quite often people will put a Hong Kong holding company or a Singapore holding company in there. Uh, this is just simpler to divest. It's an additional shield of liability and you can get reduced tax rates if you actually do qualify, if you operate in Hong Kong or in Singapore. And so then they would set up the WUFI and then you would have these control documents with the VIE. And so these will be often an exclusive service agreement. So the, control, the controlling company can only provide the operating company with this service We'll have a proxy agreement in place so that you know we will have the shareholders' rights. There'll be an operation agreement. So again, the WUFI can control how the VIE is operating. And then we have things which may not be that easy to actually enforce in practice, but we have a call option so we can buy the equity or we can get a nominee to buy the equity. Because again, you have to remember, the WUFI would not normally be able to buy the VIE because then we wouldn't need the VIE. So what we will have is uh, the option to buy it for a different nominee. And then we will often have a pledge. So really, again, like I mentioned, the, the, the main way of you know, designing it is the WUFI has the maximum business money and employees possible, and the VIE as little as possible. Um, unfortunately, in practice, the contracts are often ignored. And if you look at a VIE five years later, the VIE, 
uh, especially if it's owned by the Chinese employee, will have 90% of the business and the Wolfie will have hardly any business. So this is a uh, management issue to manage. So it's not just the design, it's also the implementation that's important. So I think for many companies, they will decide that even though there's legal uncertainty, for many, they will still decide to take the commercial risk to do a wholly foreign owned entity plus a VIE, because they often think it's the best option available to them to operate in China. Um, you know, they will think that, you know, operate, uh, obtaining the VATS license can often be easier and quicker than having a joint venture. They will then perhaps balance, you know, having a VIE owned by a trusted or a disinterested shareholder, it might be safer than having, you know, relying on a distributor or even a joint venture because, you know, there you will have perhaps more powerful Chinese partners who have a much stronger interest in your business and it's harder to align. Uh, and then I think, you know, so that's the commercial discussions. I think where people can minimize their risk or re reduce the risk is by having the proper planning, the right structuring, but also make sure, like I just mentioned, that you really implement it, that you don't just have it on paper, but you actually do actively try to have as much business as possible in the wholly foreign owned enterprise and not in the VIE by default. Um, the other advantage of the VIE, the timing is quick and certain. Um, the operational licenses would take more time than setting up the Wolfie, but compared to doing a joint venture, um, I think it's quicker to do this, and I'll look at that in a minute, but it'll be quicker with the VIE. So if we're talking about timing and certainty, it's probably a better bet than a joint venture. If it works right, you have 100% control of management and sales and marketing. And we haven't really seen many cases, well, I haven't seen any cases of authorities challenging the VIE model yet, but there have been contractual disputes, but we've also seen contractual disputes in joint ventures. And I don't think they were easier perhaps to resolve than the VIE one. Um, you know, the, the drawbacks, which are, you know, that you're relying on a contractual control, I think in practice, they're not different than in a joint venture or in a contractual relationship with a distributor and arguably might be easier than having a dispute with a joint venture because you can more likely cut yourself off from the VIE, uh, whereas in a joint venture, you're kind of stuck in there. It's not easy to unilaterally exit. Okay, so yeah, just really briefly, because it's not very interesting, but you know, just for the, the license, um, so the reason why is the VATS license will not be the same people that issue the business license. So, you know, it goes through the MIIT and there's different steps. And these steps look very easy to do, but in reality, some are easy to obtain, others are difficult. It might be the authority is no longer approving those kind of applications, or they're just taking a long time. And that tends to be the more sensitive ones. So I think, um, you know, you have to individually look at the different VATS licenses you need to consider whether you should have a VIE or whether your wholly foreign owned enterprise or joint venture can actually just obtain the licenses. This was the fourth episode in our mini series, Entering the China Tech Dragon, all about VIEs. Our next episode will be about data security law and how you could protect and comply with Chinese regulations. If you have any questions related to this episode or any of the previous episodes, please feel free to reach out to Mark or any of us directly or leave your questions in the comment section below.